Hello, and welcome to our screening of The Sun and the Medicine Man. I'm Rick Davis, the Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts at George Mason University, and it is so wonderful to have you with us for this special showing. The film you'll be seeing was created by Andrew Jorgensen, one of the inaugural recipients of our Young Alumni Commissioning Project Awards. He's a Mason alum, class of 2017, and the current technical coordinator for Mason's film program. The grant that Andrew received was critical in helping him finish this project. The Young Alumni Commissioning Project is made possible by a generous bequest from the estate of Linda E. Gramlich for the support of young artists, and by donors to Mason's Giving Day, including Shugal Research. This screening will be rounded out by a conversation between Andrew, who served as the writer, producer, and cinematographer of this project, and Paul Higgins, the director of the film. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Andrew to introduce The Sun and The Medicine Man. Enjoy. Thank you, Dean Davis, um, and good evening, everybody. My name is Andrew Jorgensen, and thank you for joining us on this cold February night. Um, I sincerely appreciate the fact that you are all here, and um, we're going to get into this film here in just a few minutes. I just want to give a little bit of context about what we're going to, uh, how this evening is going to play out. Um, the film is only about 20 minutes, so we're going to be streaming the film, um, and then shortly after, uh, I will be joined by uh, my collaborative partner um, and director, Paul Hugens, and we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of the unique collaboration that we had on this project. Um, I hope that we will be able to also get a chance to have a Q&A session with the audience. So as you're watching, I encourage you to uh, participate in the chat window on Facebook and on YouTube. I do want to take a one very quick moment um, and thank some uh, uh, people. I do think it's really important to remember that when you're making a film, especially something of this nature, uh, it takes a village of people to make these things possible. Um, I've had a lot of great collaborators um, that have come on to this project, whether it was during production, during sort of my initial brainstorming of this film for the last many years, and also after the film was made. Uh, I've had a lot of great feedback from people within our community, um, and I thank every single person that has been involved in this project from the bottom of my heart. Um, it's very hard and it's very nerve wracking to do something very personal. and um, it has been amazing to be supported by such an amazing group of people. In particular, I want to take a moment and thank uh, my collaborative partner again, Paul Hugens, um, my executive producer, um, Ian D'Amelia, who has been instrumental in making a lot of this possible. A lot of the team that was involved in helping with locations, um, other producers, Joel Morris, uh, Ziad Foti, um, all these people have made this film what it is. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also have to take a moment and recognize that uh, this film is the blending of stories. It's a blending of my family history and the blending of a very specific narrative within my family. Uh, but it is also trying to understand my family's experience in the context of my wife. Um, my Itzel has been an amazing partner in making this film a reality. Um, there's so much of this film that's inspired by her, and I am immensely grateful to her for her support over the years in making this film possible. Um, if it wasn't for her, I don't think this film would have been made. So um, I'm going to stop babbling. I um, want to make sure that we have an opportunity to watch the film, and uh, we'll have a chance to uh, have a Q&A afterwards. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with The Sun and the Medicine Man. I've been having this dream of a park in the summer. And in this dream, there's always this little boy who I've never seen before. On the other side of the park, I can smell the grill. I can hear the sound of music blasting from the portable speakers. The other kids laughing and playing but it's all just a background. I always come back to this little boy who never seems to stop running. 
and although I've never seen him before, I feel like I know him. I wish I could help him. Tell him it will all be okay. Tell him it's okay to stop. No. Why not? Your dad is sleeping. Plus, I can concentrate on the driving. Can't hear nothing. He's knocked out. Sweetheart. And that's that. Um, well, I hope you all enjoyed. Um, I just want to remind everyone that um, we're going to be trying to do a Q&A towards the end of our uh, brief conversation here. So if you are tuning in on Facebook or YouTube, uh, we encourage you to participate in the chat window. Um, we're not going to be actively, Paul and I are not going to actively be monitoring the, the chat itself. Uh, we have uh, an amazing team that is supporting this live broadcast in Megan, Haley, Will from uh, CVPA that are going to be helping us with um, passing on the questions from you all. So uh, we'll see how this goes, but we're going to uh, talk for a few minutes. I just want to really take a couple minutes and talk about collaboration, but before I do, I think it's really important that we take an opportunity to introduce Paul uh, to people who are not familiar with Paul. Paul and I go back a pretty decent ways, right? Um, yeah. Back, it was back in about 2013, right? I think is when we were both, we, uh, I think I started the Angelica movie theater over there in uh, Maryfield back in uh, 2012, like December, 2012. So, um, but anyways, Paul and I, uh, started as uh, movie, movie theater managers. Um, I just want to say a little bit out of his bio. I'm going to be reading it over here. Uh, Paul Hugens is an independent filmmaker based in Virginia, uh, known for his editing skills and dedication to pre-production and project management. Paul graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2009, something that we will not hold against him, um, <laughs> with a major in photography and film. Um, but... Uh, Paul has written, produced, and directed award-winning films across various genres and mediums. Um, and Paul currently serves as a post-production coordinator at a post house in Arlington. Um, the thing that I want to add is that um, in the years that I've been working in film and in the years that I've been working in electrical departments and working in uh, cinematography, and I've worked with a lot of directors. And generally, I would... Um, I generally look at some directors as auteurs and some directors as, um, as, uh, pay for hire. Um, meaning that, uh, at least in terms of the auteur, I would describe an auteur as someone that, um, is heavily involved in the filmmaking process, uh, is very involved from start to finish. And Paul, I would definitely describe as such, but in this film, I challenged him to do something a little different. I challenged him to come in and work almost as a, uh, as a for hire director in that I was looking for someone that w could come in and help guide actors and, and have conversations with uh, the talent, but also sort of help me guide uh, the film and just sort of be my second set of eyes and ears and really just sort of give me a lot of guidance 
uh, while on set. But Paul, like, do you want to talk a little bit about like what your sense of like the difference is? Like, did I wrap, did I sum that up correctly? Um, uh, how do you feel about like this, like, you know, your role as an auteur and then having to shift for this film? Well, thank you for the introduction and congratulations on your film. Um, I don't know about auteur, but yeah, basically uh, I've been an independent filmmaker for a few years and um, as I'm sure, uh, since I'm pretty much independent, I create my own projects. Every film I've made up until now has started on, I started on it with an idea in my head, started on the page and I was there through pre-production, production, post-production. And in this case, Andrew came to me with a project that he's been wanting to do for a few years. And it was just really fun to take on a challenge where it was basically, I was brought, I came up to set. He'd already had the crew and the cast and, the, and my goal during the production was just to make sure that we can make sure that your film gets uh, completed to the best of your vision. So it was a collaborative process where normally on my, more normally on the projects I work on, I, that I've directed, I've uh, come in with a full storyboard, every shot beat mapped out. Obviously you do a little give and take with the actors, see where they're going. But in general, it's all planned out in my head. And in this case, it was fun to get on set and Basically, I knew what kind of film you wanted to make, Andrew. So it was working within making sure that your vision came completed. It almost felt to me like I would imagine what maybe it's like to work on a, a television show where you come onto an already moving ship and your job is to just make sure that at the end of the day, they have the footage and they have the performances that they need. And I really want to well, thank you for bringing me off of that process because I've never done it before. Everything I've done before has been something that I've lived with for months, years beforehand. In this case, it was just fun to get on set, shoot, and help you make a movie. Yeah, in many ways, I thought I, I you know, as I was thinking about how I wanted to frame uh, this like q and I was thinking in a lot of ways we had a role reversal in the traditional sense, right? The fact mm -hmm. that like um, you were coming into a project that I had pretty well laid out and I had a pretty clear idea on what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. I think maybe a couple of times I described it as like, I had images burned in my brain for years that I was like trying to grab. And, um, but I think ultimately what I really value um, in having someone of your skill set is the fact that um, our actors felt, uh, I felt like our actors had such uh, incredible guidance. And I think you really were, critical in helping pull out a lot of the performances um, in in the film. Um, and so, you know, I thought it was interesting to watch you work in this particular case because you weren't uh, coming in as the auteur, but you were you were focusing on that craft, right? The the craft and skill set of guiding actors and guiding performance. Um, yeah, a combination of that and just making sure we got the day done. And yeah, it was it was very it was very fun and interesting to do, to not, because this is this is your baby, not mine. I came on to make sure that to work with you to make sure that could happen. So it was very kind of liberated and free to just get on get on set that day. Just be like, what do we need? We need scenes three, five, and six. We need to get those done today. And it was it was very freeing for me to just work with everybody and just make sure that we could get um, your film completed and get stuff done on time. And yeah, it was just, it was creatively, I felt it was pretty freeing because I was just focused on the production that day, on um, just the shooting. And then after we finished shooting, I got to check in with you every couple of months and see how the film was developing. Are you happy with where it's gone? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think the film is, um very, very different from the film that I wrote, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the the very earliest draft was a direct adaptation and then I, or a direct like retelling of the way the original story was told to me by my grandfather and then, and then this version or, and then I wrote a version of 
uh, the, similar to what we see now, and then even in the editorial process, landed on this idea of telling it from the context of this letter that um, that Patricia is writing to her aunt who passed to Tia Rosa. And so like in many ways, it's a very different film, but I think I am very proud of it. And I think it's just, it's one of these things that it, a, a good thing takes time, right? And sometimes, uh, you know, it, it, takes, it takes a moment to sort of discover the film that's already there. And so I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it was due to the fact that we were able to get uh, performances that I think had a lot of opportunities in post. And so that was really valuable, I think. And that was something that, um, as someone who primarily focuses on being a shooter, doesn't ha have a lot of time in the editorial process. I, it's something I definitely learned was uh, very valuable is to get performances that had enough variety that you had options. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was great to see how the film developed over the year plus since we shot it. Man. And of course, this last year, we won't talk oh about it. But... <laughs> no, we can <laughs> if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was great to check in every few months and see how the film developed. So I guess that would be my next question because, you know, I have two projects of my own that I'm working on. One that I shot uh, in November of 2019, right before all this started. Um, how did you find doing uh, post throughout 2020? Well, so we shot, um, what was it? Summer 2019. So we shot early summer 2019. And then um, I, uh, I shot it the summer before I started in my MFA program. So very first semester of the MFA program, um, I spend basically the first, uh, that those couple months there in the fall cutting the film. We come up with a draft. We go ahead and play, uh, the film for a small audience during, uh, a critique period. That's where I got a lot of the feedback. And, um, one of the interesting pieces of feedback that I got was in one of the earlier cuts of the film, the audience didn't know who the main character was. There was a question as to whether or not it was uh patricia or jose the father mm -hmm. and um you know i sat on that i sat on that question for a really long time because i thought it was plainly obvious but i was trying to figure out how i could address it and um i don't know what it is i think it's maybe standing in the shower or something silly mm -hmm. like that but sometimes sometimes you just have an idea that hits you and i was like a letter right Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, like in college, I wrote a film, I, I made a, a, a short film that dealt with telling, you know, telling a story through a letter. So for whatever reason, I feel like I came back home to this idea of, of, you know, writing down how you feel and then using that as the guiding uh, force behind telling the story. Um, so I think for me, that was like just the interesting discovery that happened in, in the post process. And it's been incredibly rewarding for that alone i think just this idea that putting something up on the shelf and coming back to it is just such an important thing in uh art mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's one of the the, the fun parts of post and, and pre-production is if you you find yourself kind of as long as you don't have like a set deadline if you find yourself kind of stuck it's best to just put things away for a few days do anything focus on anything else and then all of a sudden yeah you'll be buying groceries with a mask or and then just ah oh, that let's do that so it looks like we have some questions and i'm going to ask sure. you this first one so this is from may santiago uh what was the starting point andrew for merging your family story with your wife's so i think i think before i address that i think i have to go back a little bit um because i don't know if anybody if everyone knows the original story but um it like seven and a half years ago, I was sitting on a couch uh, with my grandfather um, at a family reunion. And we were going through a box of old photographs. And in the box, there was a picture of my great grandfather uh, who was standing. Um, the miraculous thing about that story is that um, 
my great grandfather, a couple of years after that picture was taken, went and lay down in a bed and basically never got up for the rest of his life. And the story of going to a, a medicinal healer and being told to lie out in the sun and drink from this drink from a mysterious jar um, and then being able to stand was part of that original story. What's where the departure is um, in terms of uh, the original story versus the way we, I told it is in the original story, my, um, my great grandfather uh, or when they went back to the healer to go find more medicine, they found out that the healer had been run out of town as a medical quack, right? This is the mm -hmm. 1930s, 1940s. So medical quackery, you, you, you think about all those, like, you know, you put your hand on two ele electric uh, probes and you'll be cured of all diseases. That's kind yeah. of the experience that they had. And um, to May's question about where does this merge? Well, thinking about that story, you know, I think the important thing to understand is that when you're in the writing process, sometimes life events have an impact on how you want to tell stories and, and what direction you want to go in with your art practice. And the frank reality is I fell in love. I fell in love with my wife. We were dating. And um, not only did I just fall in love with who she is as a person, but I also just genuinely appreciated her family and her culture. And I was just intrigued and drawn in to try and understand. I asked myself, I guess the question that came up was what if I told this story from that perspective? Like what if it was in a modern context, but more importantly, what if it was in the context of a culture in which um, medicinal healers is part of the culture, right? Um, I, I think it's, I think it was just a, for me, it was something that I was interested in exploring. And I think with the pursuit of any form of art, just having a question that you want to pursue is really important. So I think that was really, um, you know, I think the, the simple answer is I fell in love and yeah. I was inspired by someone and that's why I wanted to make sure that that's why the merging happened, I guess. I had this idea and I had someone who inspired me. Well, that's, that's awesome. I wasn't fully aware of that. That's great. Uh, we have another question. This sure. is uh, with, with having such a specific vision for the film, something you plan, you've been thinking of for years, which scenes did you have to shoot multiple times until it felt right? I mean, Paul, I think you can help me with this because mm. you were definitely helping with uh, guiding the talent. But my my general rule of thumb is you never shoot one take, right? Unless it's like no. perfect, but you're always no. shooting multiple takes, right? And and I'm a believer in the three take rule. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nothing good happens after the third take, but then you'll be the person to kindly remind me that sometimes the best thing happens after the third take. Um, but yeah, I'm a big believer in three takes minimum. Minimum, but, um, right? Minimum. Uh, but what what was your sense? Um, a scene that I was really proud of the, um, was the final scene between the two of them on the bench because I felt between uh between the two of them because I felt that was. That was one that I felt we got the best with the most amount of best coverage on. And it um, it was definitely since it was definitely since it was the closer of the film, it also needed to be the most effective. I have both the performers brought it really great there. Um, obviously there were technical ones, like we had a shot where someone was parking their car. We had to do that many times to get it right. But um, on this one I didn't feel there were too many scenes. From my end, I didn't feel that there were too many scenes where we we did too many, we, we shot too many times or did too many takes. Because also, I can't remember, we had what, four days? It was a pretty tight production. Like Yeah, it was. I would have loved to have had another day or two, but you know, you work with what you got. Uh, let's see. Andrew, another question from G6 Pictures. As a cinematographer, when you were building your visual language for the film, 
what were some of your goals and points of inspiration? Um, so for me, the film really revolves around one image and that image is, um, uh, Jose throwing himself out of the chair and trying to pick up Rosa and trying to stand on his feet. Because I think for me, that was like the critical crux of the film. And I spent a lot of time looking at images from, uh, images produced around war, because, you know, we're talking about in this adaptation, we're talking about a veteran and how they would approach, uh, you know, trying to, trying to care for someone that they see in a crisis. And, um, you know, I was really, uh, you know, I, I probably had done research on, I probably had about a hundred images sitting on my hard drive of just mm -hmm. that one shot and just trying to think about how I wanted to accomplish it. And I was also thinking a lot about um, films like The Hurt Locker and mm -hmm. just a lot of like, I was thinking a lot about wartime imagery, but I was also trying to figure out how, what mode I could approach the film in a way in which it felt empathetic. Like I didn't want to make a war film, like I didn't want to draw up a specific set of war imagery that felt like war. I wanted it to feel empathetic and feel like we were part of that moment as an audience. And so for me, a big thing I was thinking a lot about was just this idea of being on your feet, being mobile and being in proximity to the performance. Mm -hmm. And so that was a lot of sort of my, um, my rationale and my thinking. Um, but like, that's one particular part, but I think any, any cinematographer that's approaching any project needs to take an opportunity and do research and pull images and, and work off of those ideas that they're seeing in other films, but also in news media and, uh, artwork and, um, you know, any of a variety of those kinds of places. Um, mm -hmm. but a lot of it was also just pre-planning. Uh, taking time to go to the locations and looking at all the spaces that the locations had, like the back of the motel, that car was actually sitting there at the motel. I was like, we can't not shoot this in the film somewhere. <laughs> and so, you know, coming up with like looking at the location and, and also drafting up ideas about how to approach um, the film and trying to embrace where you are and the play and what mm -hmm. the, what that space feels like. Um, is another like really important part, but if you have the research, you've been thinking a lot about the imagery, um, you know, the other, the, the other bit of it is really just making sure you embrace your location and understanding, making sure you have the right location that adds texture to the film and trying to find ways in which you can capture contrast. Um, yeah, that was, that was an amazing shed. We just, we shot in for the, the medicine man. Oh, you told me about how many that hours was like, hmm? how many hours were we in that shed i feel like we were there for like six hours in that like shed it was but it was brilliant it was like it was a really great location i'm really we kept everyone really kept lucky. everyone hydrated we yeah, kept everyone exactly. hydrated so we survived yeah because when you told me about that shed i was like okay the shed let's see what you we know, can do and then it was a it was a house but you want to know the miraculous thing is I actually was thinking about building that shed. Like I was actually thinking of building it in a, in a dark space and then just lighting it artificially. I was thinking of this, like, you know, I was amazed that we actually found it like a real standing shed. And it was through the, the, one of the most amazing human beings. Again, like when I think about the people that supported this film, uh, my lifelong mentor, that was his house. Um, that was his, that was, that shed was just like back at the back of the property and it was just a brilliant, brilliant location. So yeah, yeah. Um, it, was, it was a great find. So I have another question for you from a Kim Schaefer. Okay. How did you choose the music for the film? So the music is the work of the brilliant Manuel Medina. Um, so um, when we had presented the original sort of cut of the film about a year ago, uh, in that graduate critique, Manuel was one of the members of the audience and I had just chosen some gen generic stock audio, like free, free music. And, As you do. um, 
as as you do when you're just trying to figure out the edit. And Manuel walked up to me. I was like, um, you know, I I want to. I'm interested in your your take on the music. Why did you do that? And he said that he was a composer. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm uh, I'm definitely thinking about redoing the music when I had the original cut. And so I brought him in, and you know, a lot of our conversations about the music was, you know, trying to base it in cultural relevance. Um, trying to choose instrumentation and trying to choose elements that felt relevant and um, uh, also just trying to um, make everything, make all of our choices on music as organic as possible. I think that was like such an important uh, part of that editorial process was just to say, every time we were like composing a moment was like, in what ways does this feel organic? In what ways does this feel not so because we're talking about sort of magical properties in a way and talking about mysticism and when you get away from making things too inorganic it it sort of detracts from the film i think how did you find uh doing the the post since you're primarily a cinematographer you work on set how did you find doing the the post end of it well um every I've learned from a lot of really wise people, but the, the one comment you hear over and over and over as a cinematographer in training is you got to edit, you got to edit, you got to edit. You got to <clears throat> learn how images need to, need to tie together and you can't live in a bubble. Um, and so um, a big thing was uh, making sure I took the time to understand how the images I shot and the decisions I made worked together or worked in bringing the film together like just understanding how that works is i think um the biggest thing i learned from the editorial process and taking so long on it okay uh let's see let's grab another question oh there's a bunch all right so, so this Paul, is from I think, I think we have mm -hmm. about we we can wrap up maybe one or two more questions so um you know we want to keep this uh succinct so, um, which one do you want to go ahead and tackle? All right. Let's do two more. So let's, sure. uh, this is from Lori Yee. You were able to tell such a complex story in such a short amount of time. Are you hoping to make this into a feature or how will you be sharing this story with the world? So as much as I make the film, for my own professional goals and for, um, you know, trying to achieve something. The reality is, is I made the film for one person and that's my grandfather, right? Like mm -hmm. if you remember in the credit, in the credits at the beginning, I say, uh, dedicated to Charlie Jorgensen who never imagined his life on screen. And so, um, yes, it is a very complex story. Yes. It could probably expand into a feature. Maybe, maybe that might happen. Um, but I think my big thing is to make sure that the one person that the film was made for gets a chance to see it. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately he's got really terrible internet, so he's not in the stream <laughs> and he's not going to watch it here. Um, but, um, how's the rest of your family saying, view the film? Sorry. How's the rest um, of your family view the film? Thought of it? Well, um, they're, they're going to find out. Uh, I, I've, I've uh, tried to keep it under wraps because I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to resolve all the questions I had about the film mm -hmm. before I shared it with probably the most intimate audience, which is, <laughs> you know, the people that really understand every moment and every word and why and what it means and how it relates to not just my life, but the wife, uh, the life of my wife and, um, mm -hmm. you know. I, we, we're going to, we're going to screen it all together at, um, when it's safe to sort of have everybody together. Um, but, um, you know, for the moment we're going to share it with, uh, festivals and we're going to try to build an audience around it outside of the family. But, um, hopefully when COVID is safe and we can have an opportunity for both sides of the family sit down, we're going to watch it together and you know, hopefully make something of it. <laughs> you got to tell me how that goes, what happens. Let's do our last question. 
Um, what did you give up from your original conception, if anything? Was there anything you find that you had to cut because you didn't know how to make it work or during the writing stage you felt it was unnecessary, even the post stage? I wouldn't say anything was cut. I mean, you make you make decisions and and you obviously have to lose things here and there. That's that's just part of the process. Um but I mean, Paul, like you you know this, uh like um when you are when you're editing and you're trying to sort of hone in on a story on the story, it's you have to make decisions here and there, but I think for I think I didn't really feel like anything got cut. I think things grew and changed and evolved in a sort of natural way. Like things that didn't work just didn't work and they didn't, they didn't stay in the film. And so um, I think I was very lucky in the fact that the film, even though it is very different at its core, at the heart of it, I didn't really give up anything. Mm. I think I, I think I stuck to the film I wanted to make, but I found tools and elements in the creative process to sort of improve it and make mm -hmm. it the film that it needed to be, I think is the best way to put it. So you got rid of the explosions. Yes. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, uh, we right. were making a mayonnaise commercial um, and then turned into this. So do uh, you, you know okay. that joke? I don't. Uh, I'll have to tell you later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, anyways, um, I guess thank you, everybody. I, you know, we really appreciate you coming. We appreciate you all hanging around and um, listening to us blabber on about <laughs> making this film. But I think it was interesting, and I think it was an interesting uh, collaboration. And I am incredibly grateful to Paul for his. Uh, wisdom and his guidance and helping me understand the film and helping me dig wisdom. out the film. Yeah, you are a wise person, Paul. Um, <laughs> wisdom, no. Uh, but, okay. But I appreciate you. I really do. And I um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. And um, stay tuned. We will uh, be announcing where we get into festivals and all that fun stuff. Um, I'll be announcing it on our social media at uh, the sun and the medicine man, all one word, or uh, you can also find out more about the film on my website, ageorgansonfilm.com. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch and we'll let everyone know um, where the film goes and what it's able to do. So thank you for joining us. And uh, we thank hope you. you all have a wonderful evening and stay warm.